Welcome everyone to the Special Education Inner Circle Podcast. I'm your host, Catherine, and today we have Molly Johnson with us, the autism consultant. Her and I met unofficially on Instagram. I was kind of stalking her stories. I think she was kind of stalking my stories too. And it turns out we have a lot in common and I can't wait for you to hear this conversation about what to do when challenging behaviors are taking over your home or your classroom. So Molly, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. And yes, we met on Instagram and, um, you know, the connection has been great to introduce you to my community and me, you know, be in front of your community just to add as much value. So thank you for having me here. Oh, you're so welcome. So um, I ask everybody when they get here, how did you end up at an IEP table? Yeah, so um, I went to school and studied special ed. And once I graduated, I was an autism teacher. Um, but during college, I worked at an autism program and it was fabulous. And this is kind of, you know, something I'd love to do, recreate in the future where I live. But I worked at this autism program. It was my first exposure to kids with disabilities. And I loved it. I didn't want to go home. I didn't feel like I had a job um, shortly after I started teaching children with autism. And, you know, after several years doing that, I noticed that, you know, I would go home from work and my students' parents would call me and say, Hey, Molly, you know, my son or daughter, I'm seeing that I'm seeing them do this at home. How should I go about, you know, stopping that? How should I go about teaching them this skill? And so there was a lot of communication outside of the classroom to help parents with skills and behaviors at home. And one day I thought, you know what, if my students, parents are having these questions and these concerns, I bet there are more parents out there with the same thought process as them, the same struggles. So I'm going to create a blog. And, you know, if one person reads it, if it helps one person, you know, that's beautiful for me and, you know, fine with me. Well, it just kind of took off. And then I started a podcast and my Instagram and Facebook, and it just kind of took off from there. Um, and I found that supporting parents at home was kind of a gap in the special ed world and something that I knew I could fill because I was filling it with my blog and my podcast and just talking to parents all day long. So, and then that's when the autism parent inner circle was born where that is where it's my group coaching program. And I consult with parents there and I, I help them make progress at home with everything that they want and the desire for their child. Yeah. So you have the autism parent inner circle. Uh, mm -hmm. You're on the special education inner circle. And then I have the the coaching group, the special education inner circle. And I love how there's synergy between the two. So mm -hmm. there, you know, I talk all things IEPs. I'm obsessed with IEPs. I'm all about preparing a child for further education, employment, independent living. But there's a lot of stuff that happens outside of the IEP. And that's not what my inner circle is for. That's what your inner circle is for. So so we're going to drop some strategies for parents today. Um, teachers, lean in and listen, because these will work in your classroom and when you're supporting your students, families also. And when I asked you, what should we chat about? What are you hearing in your community is a hot topic. The first thing you said was challenging behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to combine that with what I'm hearing about um, families really struggling, like they thought they had things nailed down at home, whether it is, you know, their hybrid learning or their full virtual, or maybe they're even, you know, back to somewhat of a normal schedule of sending their child to school every day. This happens all the time. You think that you have things under control. You have this like honeymoon period maybe of a new plan and things just fall apart. So let's just hop in with um, the situation of a family at home, things were going well and now they're not. What do we do first? Yeah. So the first thing I would tell parents is that the environment plays a massive role in everybody's behavior, your behavior, my behavior, your child's behavior. So we need to look at the environment and what's there and maybe what's not there that needs to be present. And so the first thing I would say is we need to provide that structure and that predictability that kids with autism really thrive in. You know, they need that structured environment. They they need um, routine. And the best and easiest way to do this for an autistic kiddo is to implement a visual schedule. This is going to organize their day because a lot of times when a kid has autism, they oftentimes struggle with executive functioning as well. So that is the, something like, you know, knowing 
you have to do these certain things in a certain order every day, that might not come as easily to an autistic kid as it would for somebody else. So we are outlining their day, we are organizing it, and there's a visual to go along with every single task that they have to do. We know that kids with autism, they have a strength in visual processing. So this visual schedule, that is playing on that strength. And it's also giving them the predictability that we know they really thrive in. You know, they need to know what's coming up next. They need to know what transitions they're going to be making throughout the day. They need to be prepared for these transitions. You know, um, if you've ever worked with a child with autism, you know that you can't just surprise somebody, you know, with, hey, okay, now it's time to move on to this. There is probably going to be some pushback. There probably is going to be some refusal behaviors because your child needs predictability. And this visual schedule is going to do just that to really work on your child's environment. Um, I would also, I talked about visuals a little bit about how autistic kids or autistic individuals, not just kids, they have um, a strength in visual processing. So I would also recommend that you create a visual rich environment. And you know, if we know a child has a strength in something, we have to take it and run with it. And we have to use that to our advantage. And you know, you have to put visuals throughout the house to really help your child cope throughout the day. I do have a free visual download on my website, theautismconsultant.us, completely free. Just download it, print it, laminate it, and um, put it to use. Because your child, we need to meet them where they're at. And we know we know they have that strength in visual processing, so we need to play on that. I love that. So I'll make sure that everybody gets the link to that down in the show notes of where they can get that download because a, a good freebie is always valuable, switching things up. Yeah. So let's just, um, let's talk about the family that, okay, they've done the visuals. They, they're they in that place where um, they've got the, you know, nighttime routine and it's put on pajamas and wash face and brush teeth and read book and go to bed. And then all of a sudden, things start to fall apart. It's like those visuals aren't working and you had them and it's like, now what? What, yeah. do, what do you do? And I, I feel that, I feel that for myself as a human being right now in the state of the world that we're living in, it's like, I got in a routine, things were going well. And then you know what? I'm just tired of the routine I, and I'm frustrated with what's happening. And I'm frustrated with a, with a lot of things. And I, I feel like our students, our children, they're feeling that same frustration. So that routine, that visuals that it was working before, it's its not working now. Right. Um, so, so what do you put into place? Yeah, so first I would recommend we kind of take a step back and look at the whole picture and what's going on and really analyze the situation because you know, all behaviors functional. Again, this goes back to everybody, not just kids with disabilities. Everybody's behavior is functional. There's a reason. That behavior is serving a purpose for your child and you know, we say it's functional and there's one of four functions that this behavior is going to be. It's going to be a sensory behavior. So they're, they're looking to um, take in or avoid sensory input. Um, they are escaping with their behavior, whether it's escaping a person, an activity, um, an environment, or the third one is attention seeking. This is a big one because I've yet to meet a child that doesn't love attention. And then the fourth function or reason why is to obtain a tangible item. So, you know, they might be acting out to get something like an iPad or mom and dad's phone, but it's always going to be one of those four functions. So first we need to understand which of those functions are they going for? You know, like I said, the behavior serves a purpose. Let's find out what the purpose is. And then we need to work on teaching that child a replacement behavior to still get that function because I can make a hitting behavior. I can make hitting go away, but I can't make the desire for what that child really wants. If that child really wants that iPad, I can't make that desire go away. So I want to still give that child the iPad, but I'm going to teach an appropriate way to do that. I'm going to teach a way that is more appropriate just for home, for society. But you know, if a child has a desire for something, they're going to keep trying different behaviors until they get it. You know, so we need to teach them a way to get it. Um, you know, this goes back to the visuals. I love token boards, and I don't know if you ever used a token board in class. But you know, if you have a child with autism and they're going to therapies or they're you know in some special class, they most likely are using a token board or something similar. So when you introduce it at home, it's not going to be a huge shock and surprise to your child. It's not going to be necessarily be something new but you are going to use this token board to get your child what they want, but in a more appropriate way. And the whole concept of it is that it's a visual support. So we're playing on that strength again, but 
It's also showing your child, you know, things like how much time is left until they get that thing that they want. They want because we also know the concept of elapsed time, like something like five more minutes. That doesn't make sense to kids that they don't understand five minutes or five hours. That could mean the same thing to them. So the token board shows them how much time is left. The, the, they're making progress. You know, every kid wants to know they're doing good and they're being recognized for their hard work and being nice to brother and sister. That might not look like hard work for us. We expect that sometimes. But for a child who really struggles with behavior, that is hard work for them. They need to be recognized. Um, you know, we need to keep motivating them. And that's a right way we're going to do it is by, you know, giving these tokens and recognizing them for this hard work. But like I said, it all goes back to finding out what is the function of the behavior? How can I teach an appropriate way to get that same thing? And then how can I reinforce that appropriate way? Because every time your child engages in that replacement behavior, that good and appropriate behavior, we want to reinforce it because, you know, back to behavior again for all of us, all of our behaviors are reinforced by something. My behavior is reinforced by something, you know, when, when I, I, I love to cook, but you know, let's say I didn't love to cook. You know, my husband, he comes home to a hot meal and he's very appreciative and he tells me and he, he cleans up the dishes. So he is reinforcing my behavior of making that hot meal every single time. So if, if we're not reinforcing a positive behavior that we're, we want to see more of, we're probably not going to see more of it. And, you know, I like to, I'm a very visual thinker and I'm a very visual learner as well. And I give the example of two plants, even though I don't have a green thumb and I kill every plant <laughs> that I have, but think of, you know, flower A, this is appropriate behavior we want to see more of. Flower B is that challenging behavior that maybe is taking over our home and driving us crazy. But naturally, we pay attention to the challenging behavior. We immediately intervene. Most times, you know, we go point our finger and say no and maybe scold a little bit. But we actually are unintentionally sometimes reinforcing that behavior. So when we think about the plants, that challenging behavior, we're watering it every time we pay attention to it. So the, that plant's growing and getting bigger and bigger. and We're seeing more of it. But that appropriate behavior we just naturally expect it. We expect kids to just pick up on that. We do it. Their cousins do it. Their neighbors act appropriately. And we expect them to just pick up on it. So we don't pay as much attention when they are nice to their brother or sister or when they, um, you know, when they aren't kicking or screaming to try to get the iPad. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, when they are, you know, asking appropriately for the iPad, we're not going above and beyond by reinforcing that. So we're not watering that plant and it's not growing. So it's just staying the same. So, you know, I like to kind of flip it. Let's flip it. Let's make it opposite. Reinforce the great behavior that your child is already doing. The stuff they're already successful at, start throwing attention at that. Start reinforcing those behaviors. You're going to see it grow. Start ignoring the negative and the challenging behaviors. Now, except, you know, if it's self-harm or harming somebody else, I don't want anybody harming, you know, their brother or sister, throwing a head through a wall, you know, obviously we have to intervene there. But if you can't ignore it, let's try ignoring it because every time we pay attention to it, we are reinforcing it. I love that. That's a strategy that a lot of times I think we all forget, especially when we're tired, because we just want to say, stop doing that. Like, you know better. Because just saying stop doing that is giving attention to the challenging behavior. Absolutely. So, you know, if we kind of go back to that bedtime routine that it was working and now it's not working, you know, I, I can hear the parent voice. I mean, I'm a parent. I, I know that voice, right? We're like, come on, you know how to do this. It's time to brush your teeth. Like, you know how to do this. I know a lot of times when I um, was talking to clients, whether I was helping them with their IEP or back in the day when I was a classroom teacher, it was like, well, let's just switch up the routine a little bit. Maybe your child went through a growth spurt. Instead of going to bed at seven, we actually have to go to bed at 730 now. And yeah. That was, yeah, no, we can change the milestones up. Yeah. And this brings up a great point. Let's look at this bedtime routine. Say you are struggling. You know, it was fine. Like Catherine said, now something's happened to where your child is struggling with this. So this is where I would maybe bring in choices, choice making. I always tell my clients, you know, the power of choices. They're amazing. They work wonders. And, you know, let's go back. We have a visual schedule for your bedtime routine. Let your child have a choice and what that schedule that nighttime schedule looks like. So let's say, um, oh gosh, let's say there are five activities you have on your bedtime routine. Get a picture of all five of those, 
let your child map out exactly what it looks like, which one's first, which one's second, and so on. Let them have a choice and what it looks like. And, um, you know, choices are so powerful because it, your child has a sense of control. You know, they live in this world where they probably feel like they don't have a lot of control. You know, the way they feel, um, the way they respond to things around them, all the therapies they have to go to, all the skills they have to work so hard on. There's not a lot of choice in their day. And, you know, what goes on throughout their day? Let's give them those choices back. And you're going to see if you are in a moment with your child and you you're really struggling, they're struggling and you just don't know what to do. Offer two choices. If it's a visual, you can have a visual picture of each one. That's always better uh, because we're playing on that strength of visual processing. But what your child is thinking in that moment is I have control of the moment, even though you're the adult that picked the two choices. It's shared control, but your child doesn't realize it's shared control. And once we make a choice and we choose something that we're going to do, we take ownership in it and we show up and we complete it. And, um, you know, when we have ownership of something, it's mo more motivating. We feel more willing to do it. So give your child choices, um, not just with the bedtime routine and, you know, creating that schedule anytime in your day. Offer your child two choices. And, you know, a lot of times if you tell your child, well, what do you want? What do you want to do? That is open ended questions are so tough for kids with autism. You know, it's it's too vague. It's too open, too many possibilities. Sometimes you have to give them their selection. So, you know, you're you're helping them with their processing needs. And then again, it, the power of choices is beautiful. They'll most likely take it and run with it and deescalate the situation right then and there. So two things, um, I love to parallel what we're doing with children to our lives as adults, because a lot of times we disassociate in the way of like, well, this is for the kids and this is for adults. So two things that you mentioned. Number one, when you ask an open ended question, it tends to cause, um, uh, you know, stress and yeah. conflict in that. And I like to compare that to how many times have you argued with your partner or your spouse about like, what do you want for dinner? I know. <laughs> and everybody's where do you like, want to go eat? It's like, yeah, oh, where do you want to go eat? I mean, I, I just heard somebody telling a story how like literally on their first date, they drove around for two hours because they couldn't each pick a restaurant. Like they couldn't agree on a restaurant. And it's not because they, they were, you know, fighting about it. It was just like, well, maybe here, do you want here? No, you pick, no, you pick. Um, and, and that's what an open-ended question does. It leaves all this ambiguous kind of thought of like, well, I don't know, like which one's right, which one should I pick? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know, if you were to say to your husband, let's go out to eat, uh, choose blah, 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 three places. You just cut, I guarantee your husband's going to pick one of those within 30 seconds. And you just made that process so much easier because you offered choices, you narrowed it down and you, you helped with, you know, the ability to process all the possible information, all the possibilities that are out there. I'm actually going to go one step further on that too, just to give everybody a little bit of a chuckle. My husband hates to make decisions and I'm a little picky about what restaurants I like to go to. And um, when we moved, he, he made a list of all the places. Like whenever I would say something, he's like, okay, so Chipotle is good. Right. Okay. Like Panera is good. Right. Okay. So this restaurant is this one. good? Yeah. So, so when he's like, listen, so when I say we're going to go out to dinner, I'm going to pick one of these. Like he made himself his own list to pick from. So he's just like, everybody will be happy and we don't have to have an argument over or, or a delay. I should even just say a delay over, over what to do. So he made his own list, his own choice board to make sure everybody was happy. That's a very, um, you know, everybody thinks that as, that doesn't apply to um, children in that way. And having those choice boards of like, this is all acceptable and everybody would be happy. That's a life skill that yeah. we have. Yeah. And you know, think about how many skill or how many choices you've already made today. We want your child to make choices. We want them to have that independence and, you know, just grasping the concept of I made this choice and I get to find out if I like it or not. So, I love it. Your child needs to know this skill. So why not, you know, get the best of both worlds with de-escalating challenging behavior and then also working on a very important life skill that they're going to use a million times a day for the rest of their life. Absolutely. So the second thing that really hit me is when you said, you know, there's this nighttime routine and let's say there's five steps mm -hmm. and, you know, four of the steps you could probably put in any order. The last one of like, go lay in bed. I mean, that's got to be last, right? Like here mm -hmm. lights out kind of thing. But those four steps that you get to choose, that is no different than you and I making a to-do list for the day. And we pick and choose which ones do we feel like doing in which order. And that gives us a sense of control, even when there's things on our to-do list that we don't want to do. 
-hmm. We all have things in our day that we are like dreading doing, but they're on our list. We'll get to it eventually. And sometimes we even pick those first to just get it out of the way. Yep. You never know what order something's going to happen in, um, you know, in your day. Well, I shouldn't say you never know, but we have a choice in how we're going to put those together. And if you're for forcing that order and it could be a flexible order, mm -hmm. that is that can just make a child feel better, just like it makes you and I feel better when we have more control over our day. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about, you know, I pull out a sticky note for the day and I, I write down 10 things that I have to do. Well, the most important things are on the top, you know, top of my mind. So that goes to the top of my list. Do I always start with that? No, because it's probably the hardest and the one that I'm probably avoiding. And so I'm going down to, you know, bullet three, bullet four, whatever it is. And, you know, that's okay because I have say in it and that's what I want to do first. And that's what's going to make me most comfortable. And then also once I complete something and I can cross that out, man, doesn't that feel good? I feel like I succeeded at something for the day. I accomplished something and it just is a sense of relief. And, you know, going back to the visual schedule that your child can use, there should be some way for your child to indicate you know, when they completed something, just like scratching off on your bullet point on your to do list, you know, whether it's moving from the to do to all done side or putting a little flap over it so you can no longer see it. That is so satisfying to all of us. So give your child the opportunity to be successful at something that they want to be successful at first and then feel that satisfaction of completing it and seeing visually that that's no longer something you have to do. You completed it. Yeah. When I was teaching, we had our, you know, every student had their desk and they had their schedule out for the day. And then they'd go over. I mean, this is very kind of classic special education classroom. They would go over and it was Velcro. It was a Velcro strip, right? They go over and pull off, let's say the music um, picture and put it back into their box for the next day. Right. And then, then the next day would come and, and I'd have the main schedule up and they would sit down and they'd make their, they'd make their own schedule for the day. They would match, you know, what was happening. And I always, um, love. I had one student that I always knew what they wanted to do and what they didn't want to do in class because when I wasn't looking, he would go over and go pull things off his schedule and put them in the all done box, even though we hadn't done it. He was like, no, I'm not going to speech today and I'm not going to do math. To, like those are all done. You know, no, thank you. Yeah. But then at least he was communicating with me. I was like, okay, so that's going to be tough today. So let's put some extra motivators in there. Let's put some extra rewards in there. Mm -hmm. So I love all of this. You know, I, I think everybody's going to have to like hit rewind and listen to this again, because I think you just dropped like probably 25 awesome steps of what you can do in the home. Can you share with everybody, where can they connect with you and reach out with you to get further support? Yeah, absolutely. Let's be friends on Instagram. You can find me. My handle is the autism consultant. That's where I'm at the most. I also have a podcast that's super valuable for parents. Uh, so the autism consultant podcast, um, not not too unique with all my my names everywhere. Same with Facebook, the autism consultant. But, you know, I just try to connect with as many parents, help as many parents, because I know you're doing everything you can possibly do to help your child be as successful as possible. And sometimes what you're doing just doesn't work. And that's OK. That's why I'm here pouring so much value and information into my social media, my Instagram, my podcast. But let's connect on Instagram. Reach out. Tell me what you're struggling with and I'll point you in the right direction. You know, no DM goes unanswered for me. I love that. So no DM goes unanswered and go get your freebie from Molly so you can get started kind of switching things up at home, get on track, reach out to her for support. Again, if you're looking for ongoing support as a parent for all things autism and behaviors, uh, she has the autism parent inner circle. If you're looking for all things education, you want to connect on getting your IEP going in the right direction, you can head over to specialedinnercircle.com. I'll make sure that you get some checks and how to connect with me ongoing. And we're going to have Molly in as a special guest into the inner circle. Ooh. I'm going to actually pop over into her autism uh, inner circle. So um, it's a lot of information coming your way. Make sure you connect with both of us. And also, if you're listening to this on iTunes, please don't forget to leave a five-star review. The more reviews that you leave, the more parents and teachers can find us and get the help that they need to make sure that every child is getting the education and support that they need to be successful. So thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you so much, Catherine. I really enjoyed this.